Hello, this is Dan Nowman, Nice Wonder, and you're watching The Nowman Show, and my guest is Ben Carollo, and he has studied biodefense, biosecurity, and biotechnology, lots of bio, uh, at the University of Maryland, and geospatial intelligence at the Community College of the Air Force. I have no idea what that is, but uh, obviously you're in the military, you're in the Air Force, uh, and he now broadcasts on Twitch, as Bleep Blomp Ben. Ben, thanks for coming on the Now Man Show. How are you today? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing great. Uh, excited to, to be here and yeah. And I know that you uh, like to talk uh, a lot about economics uh, on your Twitch channel. Of course, I, it's one of the topics I cover when I'm not doing entertainment. And you are versed in modern monetary theory now a lot of people you know have heard that term um they some people uh, watching might know who stephanie kelton is people like that can you uh, uh unwrap that for us a little bit or what is that exactly yeah most definitely so modern monetary theory first and foremost i think is a little bit of a misnomer because it's kind of always how money worked right um and to really understand it i think the easiest way is to dive into like the history of it um, really money in itself is something that's created by governments, right? It's created by governments to fund things like the military, you know, building roads, bridges, all the things that government likes to do. Um, it's got to pay for it somehow. Um, so it creates money. It comes to modern monetary theory. Um, first and foremost, I think it's a little bit of a misnomer because it's kind of always how money works. And the central philosophy is that governments create money through their spending um, and then just manage inflation via taxes, right? A lot of people have the idea that the government is out there like crunching numbers on spreadsheets, trying to make things balance out like you might do like your home finances, but it's not really how it works, right? Uh, the government, their really only concern is having to worry about their money creation relative to the demand for money, um, which, you know, if there's high demand for money, that means inflation's gonna be low. If there's low demand for money, uh, that means inflation is going to be high. Now, you could say, Ben, I always have a demand for money. I need to pay my rent, need to pay for food and things like that. Yeah, most normal people in our every single, like everyday lives, um, we have a high demand for money. Right? And so it doesn't really make sense to like tax working class people on basically anything. Um, but then you look at the people who have a low demand for cash, right? The people that are dumping money into stock buybacks, right? The large corporations, people like Jeff Bezos, right? Instead of cash assets, they dump their money into things like capital assets, you know, your stocks, your bonds, your real estate, things like that. Um, and when they do that, they cause inflation by driving demand for dollars down. Um, and this is kind of always how money works. A lot of people pretend that it's a modern phenomenon, but the truth is that early ancient kings found out that creating money was just a really easy way to manage an empire, right? It's actually really hard to micromanage the movement of troops and the supplying of troops and all these people with carts and wagons delivering things all over the world. It's really difficult to manage an empire that way. So early em emperors and kings, they just invented money. They said, all right, we're going to give the soldiers these tokens, right? Then we're going to stamp our face on it. Um, and then we're going to go to the peasants and the artisans and the craftsmen and the so-and-so, um, and we're going to demand taxes from them. And the reason why we demand taxes from them is literally just to, to make things easy, right? It, it, it turns the entire country into an entire machine to fuel their military, right? Which is sort of the first thing that empires did, that like governments did. Um, and it really operates on the same principle today, right? The only reason there's demand for cash is because the government demands it in the form of taxes. That's what creates demand for currency in the first place. And so um, we've kind of always operated on that system. Uh, it's just kind of, there's been moments in time where we kind of deny that's the reality, but ever since John Maynard Keynes came around um, and like studied a little bit of anthropology and said, wait a minute, money's always kind of worked like this. Um, we've, you know, in the Western world managed our economies as though government creates money out of nothing and then demands money in the form of tax taxes in order to create demand for currency. Um, and that's sort of the spot that we're in right now. And that's where I think 
it's just super important to understand because it's so central to basically every other debate, right? When people talk about um, healthcare and universal healthcare, when people talk about um, you know, public works projects and get job guarantees and things like that, there's always this question of, oh, how do you pay for it? Yeah. Uh, but the truth, the truth is, right, that the only limit to what the government can pay for by creating money is just the entire productive capacity of the country and how far they want to go to tell everybody what to do, basically, right? So yeah. um, if they're willing to pay everybody to be doctors and nurses and guarantee healthcare, then it turns out you're going to have doctors and nurses and we're all going to have guaranteed healthcare. Um, and, you know, they just create the money to do that. The only limit is how many people can you get to do what you want them to. Um, and so that pretty much just means everybody that lives inside the country is your hard cap on, you know, how much you can really do is the total productive um, labor capability of the entire country. Um, it's crazy and, that the whole thing would be based on a piece of paper or, or a coin or a, a, a mineral, you know, and that that would be used to basically control the society, right? Because really, if you think about it, uh, it's, it's, there's a, an authoritarian element to that. So we could say, has there really ever been a democratic society because of currency? You know, be, there's always you know, a small group of people that want to control the society and, and control the, the, the money and how much they give themselves basically by control when they do control it. I mean, yeah, most definitely. I mean, you know, the easiest way to figure out, the, the easiest way to figure out um, how demand for money is created is to not have it right? Yes. You know, you realize if you don't pay your apartment, right, if you don't pay the rent in your apartment, at a certain point, you know, armed agents of the state are going to show up and drag you out of your apartment, right? Same thing with your house, same thing with whatever, you know, try to go to the grocery store and say, I don't want to use dollars, you know, you could even try to barter with them, you try and you bring in a chicken to your grocery store and you say, hey, will you, will you take you know, this chicken for those eggs and bacon and whatever, and they're going to call the cops and right. you know, like, you're going to find out really fast, you know, you're going to find out really fast. Or the um, Center for Mental the, Health, they might call them. Yeah. Them, but yeah. Um, and so, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really inherently authoritarian um, in its very nature. Now that said, I mean, you can have um, like sort of democratic ways of governing how that's done. And that really, I think, goes to show with you know, if you look at, you know, democratic countries, right, if you look at countries that have like strong ish democracies, they will spend their money on improving the lives of people in the country. And then you look at, you know, sort of middling democracies or arguably failing democracies, maybe like the United States. Um, <laughs> and you, you will see the government spending tons of money on things that are irrelevant to the needs of people. They'll spend a lot of money on the military and police and things like that to sort of keep people under control and do, do what you need to do um, and to, to you know, go around the world and exploit poor people all around the world to get natural resources and things like that. Um, and then, you know, if you go to like full authoritarian states, right, you know, early emperors, I mean, basically the only thing they spent money on was military. Um, and so the level of democracy that you can kind of see is how much is that system of money creation being utilized to the benefit of working class people and how much of it is being utilized to the benefit of, you know, just whoever happens to be in power at the time. Yeah, I think a very good point because, you know, we have uh, some recent examples of, of how um, money is just created. You know, we call it fiat money. Uh, and we don't know how that is basically going to uh, roll out over time because uh, it's, it's last, last March, for instance, there was the CARES Act, which was for some trillion dollars plus that was given to the owners of essential businesses, uh, essential businesses in quotes. Uh, what, what does that mean? Yeah. And uh, basically it, it, from what we can tell, uh, it was mostly uh, billionaires and multimillionaire owners of these so-called essential businesses to decide what to do with that money. So some of it was created in the form of PPE loans, but as we've seen in the past, when that kind of thing happens, how many of those loans are really gonna get paid back? So it's kind of like the same as free money. So, and then we also saw uh, 
the $1,200 and the $600 stimulus checks. So we know how this works now. The, the average person can't see that this is money that just is created out of nowhere and then it's given to you. Think about the, the level of trillions of dollars given to basically a handful of people and this is nothing new for them. This is why the priority was to make them comfortable, right? So, so that they can continue to go about their lives how, you know, buying you know, fancy cars or more property or, or whatever, taking trips or whatever it is that they're doing, you know, their lives don't have to be disrupted, essentially. But we still don't know how that's going to roll out with the, the next stimulus bill. You know, they're fighting over who's going to get what, essentially. And this is not a sustainable system. And I think now we are seeing that, that, you know, and the same thing is true in Europe. I mean, they've made some better decisions about how to help the people in a more democratic fashion than we have, because you know, in Europe and in Canada, they're getting a monthly stimulus check. Plus they don't have to worry about healthcare. They already have access to that. Uh, whereas here in the United States, obviously there's still millions of people that don't have any healthcare coverage and millions of others that go bankrupt because it's just so outrageous because it is for profit much of it the focus is still on the 0.01 percent people at the top there's a uh, in the united states 86 percent of the wealth uh i think in 2020 went to the top 20 percent of the population again nothing new but this is uh, this is insane I, I can't think of another word to describe it because you know, it's, it's very clear for those of us who have done the work that there are solutions. We, we can get out of this mess. Um, so speaking of getting out of this mess, um, what in your view are uh, some ways to do that? Yeah, I mean, oh, there's kind of a lot to, um, there, there's sort of a lot to unpack there. And I kind of want to touch on like how we got to this point in the first place. And then maybe I'll go to the future from then because um, cause I mean, once upon a time, right. When FDR was running around, um, you know, they understood the principle of aggregate demand, right. They were like, okay, um, the government's job is to create markets, right. Cause the big mythology about capitalism is, oh, you have these free markets and this, that, and the other thing. But, you know, as we understand the creation of money as being like the state just saying, Hey, here's money, you know, go ask people to help you with these projects. Um, you know, like the role of the state has always been to create the markets that exist, right? And so what would have happened in the past and what's happening in other Western countries, not like the US, is they're handing money to people. They said the markets are struggling. So what we need to do is we need to get money to regular working class people so they can spend and they can create natural markets. And anything there's not a natural market for, um, we we'll use government spending, right? You know, you use things like, um, you know, like input money to DARPA so that they can research technology that nobody wants or needs yet. Um, you know, put money into, you know, the National Institute of Health to fund research projects for drugs that don't exist yet. You know, um, that's how we got all the technological development. Uh, but then Ronald Reagan comes along and basically says, let's cut out the middleman. We all know the whole point is just to give these money to the corporations anyway. So how about instead of giving money to people to do things that they actually want or need, well, let's just give that money directly to these companies. And ever since then, you've basically seen these like, periodic crashes, the um, sort of economic collapse sort of perpetually happening. And sort of every time it happens, uh, it just gets worse and worse. Um, meanwhile, you have like literally like roads falling apart and dams falling apart and bridges falling apart all over the country um, because none of that real demand is being created. But that's kind of inherent to the system of capitalism that we live under. Because if you have people who are super rich, um, you know, they're at a certain point going to be always thinking of how do we cut out that middleman? The same thing is happening in the UK, where they're thinking about they have the National uh, Health Service, right? They have the NHS in the UK. And there's rich people in the UK who are like, okay, but let's cut out the middleman. Why do we need to get healthcare to these poor people just for me to get bankrolled, right? Like, why do, exactly. why do we need, why, why don't we privatize this? Right. And you see that all over the Western world. And it's it's sort of a fundamental problem that exists in capitalist and capitalism is because rich people kind of just can't help themselves. They just want to keep getting richer, it turns out. Um, and so, I mean, when it comes to solutions, I mean, you know, I would argue um, 
moving to like a more democratic economy, right? In a way that like some might say socialism, right? Where, you know, you have countries like Vietnam and Cuba that try and develop their economies by setting up like worker cooperatives and like housing cooperatives and things like that. You know, actually putting real democratic control over the actual um, like institutions of economic development, right? Like, like taking companies and putting them under the control of workers because workers, they want to provide for their community, right? They, that's, that's, that's simple, right? Workers is, is us, right? Um, if you work in a factory, you don't wanna just produce extra cars for no reason. You wanna produce enough cars for everybody to have a car and so that you um, can take care of yourself and your family. And if new automation technology comes along, um, well then, yippee, you have shorter hours. Congratulations to you. Um, everybody's needs are met. You can build the best car you can build, and then there you go. But under capitalism, if they automate um, some part of the job, they're either going to pay workers less, um, or they're just going to lay off workers. And in both situations, rich guy gets richer, poor guy gets poorer. And that's re really the situation that we're in now. And so, I mean, I really think the alternative is you know putting in place things like the green new deal that has like a jobs guarantee um and then putting in place things like like worker cooperatives and, and stuff like that um i think it's also important to recognize that um moving forward a lot of america's international relations um is i mean it's predatory right like uh, we develop our economy based off of just getting super cheap natural resources from countries that we've pretty much invaded or installed like dictators that are really friendly to us and things like that and so not only is it a matter of democratizing the local economies that we live in so that more responsive to our needs but also democratizing the global economy so that um you know people living in the global south actually have real democratic control um, over their part, right, so that they get a piece of the pie, right? Like that's that's the whole idea is that maybe everybody gets a piece of a piece of the pie. Maybe everybody should have a say on how the global economy works. Maybe it shouldn't just be like eight dudes at the IMF deciding that um, you know Nigeria doesn't need to develop like a, a healthcare system or public education. Um, you know, like that's uh, maybe perhaps we can all just work together instead. <laughs> Exactly. And I think it, it, it's, it's, it's complex, but it's also very fun, fundamentally very simple, I think, uh, the more that I study it, the more that I talk to people. Uh, because, you know, it's, in essence, you know, looking at the system that dominates, it's capitalism. And, you know, uh, the root of the word implies exactly what it's all about. And uh, it's stuff, commodities, which we have seen, you know, people were turned into commodities and still are. Uh, as you know, Marx analyzed so so very well. Uh, but really, at the, the bottom line is is you know people over profits. So I wear this button a lot, um, and that's the solution. And that really wouldn't be capitalism as we're seeing it. And of course, you know, some people say that's crony capitalism. And I'm thinking, well, look, you know, I get what you're saying, you know, but. But it's you know defining putting adjectives in front of capitalism is kind of like saying we have this humongous difference between uh, Adam Smith uh, and Milton Friedman or something, when when really there isn't a lot of difference. Yeah, you know what well, I mean. Well, I think that that ties into <laughs> the origin of capitalism itself, and this is a history that I think a lot of people forget. Right, when capitalism started. Well, what existed before was feudalism, right? Mm -hmm. A combination of like a feudal system and like a mercantilist system. And basically what happened is the merchants and the aristocrats, right? Because so for those of you who don't know, a feudal lord would basically pay people to loaf around inside of their house. Their whole job would be to <laughs> loaf around inside of their house. Anybody who's watched anything like Downton Abbey uh, kind of understands this to some degree. There's people that are like, what do you do for jobs? No, you don't understand. The landlord just likes them as people. And so they're paid to just loaf around. That's their whole job. That's the aristocracy. Um, well, the aristocrats were a little upset. They were like, they got bored, you know, just loafing around the house. They're like, I want to start my joint stock corporations and go to the Americas or whatever. Or, you know, I think maybe I want to build like a factory now because we're doing industrialization. Um, and so the system, the way it was traded off basically was like, okay, 
um, we'll give a little bit more economic mobility to like the aristocratic class and the merchant class. Um, and that's the whole point of capitalism, right? Is all right, the feudal lords will take a step back and maybe we'll develop a little bit more um, so that all of these, you know, aristocrats that hang out with us can get royal charters and can go start their companies and do their thing. It was never about peasants, you know, starting their own factory or whatever. Exactly. It was, that's never what it was about. It was always about, at its fundamental roots, um, capitalism was always about basically giving um, a little bit more economic mobility and freedom to people who are already near the wealth. Um, and, and that's kind of how it's been until today, like still to this very day, uh, basically, you're not going to have any success under capitalism unless you have rich parents for the most part, right? Bill Gates, rich parents. Elon Musk, super rich parents. I mean, Elon Musk literally, you know, uh, you know made, made most of his money, right? His parents made their money uh, running an emerald mine in apartheid South Africa, right? And so if you look at the people um you know who are really making it today they are people who you know have parents that can basically buy them a house and you know give them a small million dollar loan um or, or some people got lucky like for instance you know like these ivy league schools you know they they allow a few you know uh, poor people to come in or a few people of color to come in just so they can say that they support diversity seriously i mean they've they've always been that way and yeah. I, I know Professor Richard Wolf talked about how, you know, he was, uh, he realized he was one of the few uh, in his uh, economic uh, uh, status that was yeah. allowed into the schools. And uh, it, it just one thing led to another. He realized, you know, you're, you're there because you're lucky, you're fortunate, you were selected or whatever, you know, and then you, you learn about that lifestyle. Uh, really more than anything else. <laughs> well, and those are really the exception that proves the rule, right? Because right. the most valuable thing that you get from going to an Ivy League college isn't the education or even the piece of paper. Um, it's the friends, or it's the friends, right. right, that you get. It's, it's having rich friends. And there was actually a really interesting study um, that I was reading like a week or two ago uh, that was talking about... Um, basically the people who do the extracurriculars in like Ivy League schools typically get worse grades, but also higher earnings afterwards, yes. right? And so the extracurriculars, of course, is where you're going to bump into other people from different backgrounds. And so that's where you're going to get the rich friend, the angel investor that gives you a million dollars to go start your project or whatever, you know, to invite you to work at their dad's hedge fund. We're in a crisis period, you know, in, in our in our lives now, actually, no one on the planet has a, experienced anything like what we're going through at this period of time, uh, because there's not only the an economic downturn, which as you had brought up, uh, happens periodically every so many years, but we also found ourselves in a pandemic at the same time, simultaneously, and so we're still trying to navigate our way through this. You know, uh, it's been a, you know, at least a year. So uh, the short-term and long-term solutions has, has been something that I've been studying, you know, since I started this show, you know, 2015. Um, and, uh, you know, I've talked to some experts on the topics, you know, Jill Stein about, you know, healthcare and Andrew Yang about the universal basic income. Um, and it, it and uh, Howie Hawkins, basically, about the original Green New Deal. They will work. It just requires the, the money to implement and, and the political will to get them implemented. Again, capitalism. Leave it in the hands of the private sector. They know how to do it better, but they, they know how to do it better for themselves. But you know, just, there's all these words that are left out when, when, when there's discussion about, about capitalism. You know, just like... Yeah. Just like in the history of socialism, there's a lot of facts that are left out. Yeah, there's been authoritarians here and there, but to deny the whole story, it just, you know, it doesn't make sense. You know, just like with China right now, uh, you know, they, yes, they're an authoritarian government, but in the last 30 uh, years, over 600 million people have been pulled out of uh, extreme poverty. They have an amazing uh, high rail uh, system that, you know, it connects with Europe now that was done over the period of a decade. And it's, it's unimaginable that anything like that could be done in the United States, right? And they even have healthcare for everyone. 
uh, and they are they have a comparable AI program to the West, anything in the West. And so now some are predicting that uh, in 10 years, it will, they will admit that they, you know, and everybody, the whole world will admit that they are number one in the world. But even though some um, uh, analysts now will say that the GDP is three times higher in China, even though they still consider themselves a, a, a developing country. You mentioned something about worker cooperatives. I advocate for worker cooperatives and I have since the beginning of this show because of Professor Richard Wolf's, uh, he's, he's basically one of my mentors. Uh, that is, I definitely see worker-owned cooperatives as a long-term solution. So what would you say, in your view, is the top priority right now? I think the top priority for it is really just making sure that we're doing things to democratize the way our economy works. Um, I guess I'll end off with an example is things like, you know, city councils can do things like revenue bonds to help people set up worker cooperatives and housing cooperatives in town. That's a power they have. And cities are far more democratic than, you know, our federal election processes, right? You as an individual citizen have way more influence over your mayor and city council than you do over the president or your congressman. Um, and really those are the things that we need to do and not just at the local level, but we also need to work and develop partnerships internationally um, so that we have a more democratic international system, right? So that the United States isn't running around forcing countries into trade agreements where they can be sued because they don't wanna sell cigarettes to children. Um, you know, the basic things like that, um, and, and so, yeah, I guess the short term step really is trying to develop as many spaces of democracy um, as we possibly can, whether that be in your housing, um, your housing cooperative, your worker cooperative, um, or even just engaging with your, your city council members. And then I guess really considering thinking about, um, you know, maybe Vietnam, the country that did the best at stopping the coronavirus pandemic has some good ideas, right? And, and consider that maybe perhaps um, we should take a look at the way they're running their economy and um, you know, ask our leaders to do the same here. And I think develop institutions of power um, to try and put pressure on politicians here to do exactly that. Thank you so much for being on the, the Now Man Show, Ben, and do come back and let us know uh, what the name of your Twitch TV channel is and also how people could get a hold of you. Yeah, definitely. So it's Bleak Blomp Ben on Twitch. And it's the same thing on YouTube, except for there's a space between Bleak Blomp and Ben on YouTube. And then I'm also on Twitter. If you want to see me posting uh, all the memes, occasionally I post serious politics stuff. Um, and, and there I'm just Benjamin Carollo. It's just my name because I ran for office and it's a public uh, Twitter. Um, and so, yeah, so other than that, Bleep Blomp Ben on uh, Twitch and YouTube. And I also have a Patreon. It's also Bleep Blomp Ben, ben Bleep Blomp Ben there as well. Thank you again so much. Uh, ben Carollo, Bleep Blomp Ben. And this is nice when you're watching the Now Man Show and always stay present in the moment now.